of those very few people that is a bridge between Western and Eastern music, as well as you're bound between the North music from India and the South music from India. And that all comes from your own personal interest, your personal ambition and curios curiosity in that music. So I wonder how would you describe to somebody basic stylistic features of Indian music, the way how you perceive it? Well, it's so individual, Peter, uh, yeah. because if I go back in time, um, I remember hearing uh, when I was growing up in Britain, I must have been about 13 or 14 years old, and there was a program by uh, a musical called Alan Lomax, and he would travel around the planet recording different ethnic music and playing it on the radio. We had a show every week. And, <clears throat> and so, and I got to hear, because I was by this time, thanks to my elder brothers, uh, very much aware of the blues, the Mississippi blues in particular. Um, <clears throat> but there was one program in one week where Alan Lomax, he said, I've got some temple music from South India. And he played, uh, an instrument, a musician playing a Nagaswaram, um, which is a temple instrument with a percussion instrument known as the Tavil. And of course, in my times in India, I've been in temples and seen and heard musicians playing this. However, um, I mean, I, I don't know, I was 13 or 14, and I didn't even know where India was. And yet I heard this music and I got really shivers all over my body. So there was some mysterious connection that I am unable to to fathom really. Um, because you know I've I've played Nagaswara music to other musicians and they, they say that's a little strange. So uh, it's very personal. So but this marked me it marked me because, of course, I continued that by this time I went from the blues into flamenco and then jazz. And I didn't get back into Indian music until mid, uh, mid, uh, my mid 20s when I began to uh, become interested in music in Indian culture, you know, mm -hmm. philosophy. Of, I mean. And it was only then, probably 10 years later, that I discovered who was playing and. Uh, what it actually was. Um, so the, my venture into Indian music was, I think, pivotal at that point, because why would it mark me in a way that, that I got marked by Beethoven when I was five years old? Th these are questions that don't really have a logical answer, do they? Mm -hmm. Some people say, yes, well, maybe you're in a, some other time in India, and, and it's as logical to say uh, I was uh, as to say I wasn't. Um, but my real uh, dive into Indian culture really began in the mid, when I'm in my mid twenties, um, when I began um, asking the great questions of life, um, which, uh, the answers to have been sought in Asia in general and mm -hmm. India in particular for thousands of years. And, and so I, with the Beatles and lots of other musicians, looked east in the mid-60s and um, very quickly found that the music and the, the uh, teachings to be found in India, which address the great existential questions, are uh, deeply connected. In fact, there are two aspects of, of one culture, um, insofar as that Indian music is, is absolutely inclusive of all the aspects of the human nature, human soul, the human heart, the human psyche, um, and uh, therefore is an aspect, uh, can be considered an aspect of spiritual development, if mm -hmm. you will. Yep. And for me, at that time, you have to realize that, that 1965 was the release of this um, wonderful album by John Coltrane, A Love Supreme, mm -hmm. who single-handedly did 
with this one recorded, we did with this recording, what um, Indian music uh, has. That is, he integrated the spiritual dimension of the human being into jazz music. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, um, you had the classical mass, you know, from the, from the great composers. Um, but uh, Coltrane did this, and of course, all of this coincided with me when I was 20, 21, 22, and this all came together. And so um, once, because it's inevitable, you discover the music once you start looking at, at the Indian culture, the Indian philosophy, um, and the music of India, both North and South, share a great deal of common ground with jazz music insofar as that they're masterly improvisers mm -hmm. improvise in rhythm and this also just happened to coincide with this new form that miles davis had created at the end of the 50s 1959 there was an album came out called kind of blue in which he really um he expressed this marvelous concept that was taken by Coltrane and many other musicians and actually revolutionized jazz. Uh, and this linear approach to jazz is so close to the linear approach to playing music in the Indian style because there are no chords, there are no, there's no harmony, there's only the linear rock. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I had to go on there, but that's really- oh, no, That's amazing background. Now, when you mentioned that linear improvisation and the part when it's a steady and modal harmony, uh, there are traditional instruments within the Indian ensemble. What are these instruments and what are their roles? Because you took these instruments and you put them into your project Shakti. Uh, so what is the role of each musician who plays uh, tabla, well, so. Shakti, if you go back to, to the beginning, in fact, even today, because because Shakti um, was reborn uh, earlier this year, um, we adopted, because of course, by, by the time um, Shakti was born in 1973, uh, I'd already been studying with Dr. Ramanathan South Indian music, but already in 1969, I was studying North Indian flute. Really, mm -hmm. that I play flute, but I wanted to, to understand and learn the theory of North Indian music. And then from 1972 on, I was studying South Indian Veena with Dr. Ramanathan. In 1973 was the first uh, really get together of Shakti, and we adopted immediately the linear way of playing because uh, Indian musicians, they are just now beginning to integrate certain forms of, of fundamental harmony into their playing. Uh, but it's taking a long time because the system of playing is so marvelous and, and, and complete in its own way. Uh, it's just the, the, the Indian musicians who want to approach the Western uh, musicians and collaborate with the Western musicians. They're looking now more at harmony. But the, the, the format of Shakti from the very beginning was an absolutely Indian format. We used mm -hmm. Shruti box or drone. And, um, and the, the, the chords that appear from my guitar were tone chords extracted out of the various ragas that we were playing. Mm -hmm. now, you know, in modal music, Western modal music, you can you take a Dorian scale and you can extract all of the chords. They're just notes of the, of the, the mode played simultaneously. That's all a chord is anyway, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, so from, from the very beginning, the only chords I played were directly related to the raga. Mm -hmm. Only just played the notes simultaneously. So that's a chord. And then as time went by, I started to look 
to how to expand my harmonic approach and how to integrate more harmony in even in the raga it means i started to bend the roots mm -hmm. but the format was purely linear indian I mean, mm -hmm. and we had zaki hussein playing tabla we had viku vinayakram playing gatam uh, and mridangam mm -hmm. so there was already north and south in two percussion players one from North India, one from South India, violin player El Shankar was from South India, and I was big in the middle. Mm -hmm. When was the first time you were introduced to Konakol? Because they are part of your compositions, and I assume it plays a big part in keeping the form. Already in 1973, when, when, uh, because I didn't have Viku Vinayakram, who was, who was, because Shakti really came. Uh, the first major recording was in 75. Mm -hmm. as, as, as a small group, because I still had the Mahavishnu Orchestra going at that time. People were playing big concerts. Back. And then, um, like small concerts in the church or school, uh, Shakti. And Zaki was there, and but I borrowed my gurus, my Vina gurus, Mridangam player. Mm -hmm. And so we had North and South. Uh, Viku came in simply because um, Ramna Raghavan, who was the Bridangam player, uh, the accompanist of my guru, uh, when uh, Shakti really came out and started touring, he was he, he, he was teaching at a university and didn't want to leave the university. Mm -hmm. which I went to India and had the fortune to find Viku Vinayakram playing Gatam. As well. Mm. Listening to recordings that you made with Shakti, uh, what was the learning process? Because you were playing in unison uh, with El Shankar, and those are, well, everybody is playing unison, really complex rhythmical forms. Uh, and how is there such a thing that you were writing it in, or you were writing it out from musicians, or those were, you know, just. Uh, regular raga that come from Indian tradition? Uh, well, the basically the tradition in India is oral. You learn everything by heart. Okay. And this is this is this because um, there was no point in me writing a particular song down because they don't read Western. Mm -hmm. they, they, they write their own. They have Particular. And I remember going through different arrangements and orchestrations with Al Shankar, and he would write it down in the South Indian way because that was it, that was his way. The, the as far as the percussions are concerned, uh, this was conical. This, mm -hmm. this they always communicated in conical. Now I was very fortunate in 1974 to be accepted as. Um, basically, an extracurricular student of uh, Pandaji Ravi Shankar, and uh, even though I don't play sitar, uh, I got to know him already in 1971, and over the years, uh, uh, more and more, I met him. And finally, and and so I was living in New York, and every time he came to New York, he would call me, and I would go over to his hotel. And in fact, he, uh, even though I'd be, be because of my association with South Indian, my South Indian guru, I was aware of, well, but actually it was Panditji, mm. North Indian, who taught me uh, the real ins and outs of Conical mm. and, and, and its application to, to improvisation. You work with these wonderful musicians and they have got incredible stories even before you met them. I'm talking about Zakir Hussain, El, El Shankar. Uh, do you have any stories that relate to them personally that, you know, when you met them and you would like to share with me? Uh, I could give you an example. I read somewhere that Zakir Hussain's dad was waking him up at three o'clock in the morning to practice his rhythm. Have you ever heard something that would be of that kind? Uh, okay, absolutely. I'm sure it's true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he never spoke to me about it, but but the, the, the school, the Indian school is extremely rigorous. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yes, uh, much more so, I think, than in in the West. Although I think the 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 real uh, now, especially the schools like the jazz schools, I'm sure they've got quite some rigorous training. The classical schools, I'm sure they have also, but they don't have this kind of. The thing is that the the teacher or the guru, he's he he has he almost takes responsibility for the student, which is not mm -hmm. the case in in the West. You know, you go to a school, the school imparts information to you, and and then and what you do with that information is really is is your affair. Uh, but there was there's a, there's a, another story of 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 um, uh, the teacher of the father of Ali Akbar Khan. Whom I got to know also. Um, what a marvelous player, uh, Alauddin Khan, mm -hmm. and um, and what and he was telling a story about his guru, who used to sit him under the tree and tie his hair to a rope over a branch, and say, "Okay, now you have to sit here and play for five hours," but when it, we'd get tired and his head would fall like this, the, the rope would pull on his hair and yank his head back up so he'd, <laughs> so he'd wake up. Uh, oh, there are stories off the top of my head um, because we have, we have quite a few. Um, but nothing like that. Nothing like that ever happened to me. But I remember Shakti doing doing a, a doing a show with Black Sabbath. We opened up to Black Sabbath, <laughs> and um, and we started playing, and and people started to throw coke can coke cans on the stage. But then we dug in, and especially when when Vico, by this time we we had a Barkus Berry pickup on his gatam, mm -hmm. and when he he hit the groove, Vico was unbeatable. It was like the God rhythm, <laughs> and, and and within about ten minutes we had the, like the, because you know these people with black south and, and black leather, long hair. There's some real, you know. And, and they were at the side of the stage with this, <laughs> like this to, with this little guy playing a gatam, you know, but because we had this Bacchus berry in it, the sound was really powerful. You know, oh, there are many stories. I should write about them one day. Oh, please do. That would be wonderful. Now, uh, you were very outspoken about the situation where, you know, when you were leaving Mahavishnu Orchestra, People also had certain expectations. Your original audience expected, you know, to hear you playing in a certain way, and you went down the road of Shakti. Uh, my next question would be: What attributes do you feel as a person has got music as an artistic platform? Because music nowadays, you know, has got popular trends, has got value when you can get a credit as a popular person, you can get credit as an expert, but mm -hmm. also you can get credit as an artist and I would like to know what kind of values do you value personally because that's your engine towards your projects well uh, you you already said it because uh, when I told my my manager that I would quit the Mahavishnu Orchestra and um, and just my main group would be Shakti uh, I got a lot of flack from my manager, he was very, actually very intelligent, and very Santa. My agent was not too happy. My record company were not happy. Um, you know, and it was because we had a very successful band, Mahavish Norcus, selling lots of records. And, you know, basically record companies, they're not so interested in the cultural aspect of music. They're interested in the bottom line, you know. And uh, but it's understandable. That's the way of the world. And I just uh, I took they 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 were little. Uh, they couldn't understand it basically. And I said I have to do this for my musical development. I have to do this because I don't have any choice if I want to develop as a musician. 
and I have to assume the consequences. And I'm sorry, you also have to assume the consequences. Just deal with it. And uh, basically, which is a nice way of saying, take it or leave it, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, but it happened to me already in the 60s I, when I had become a, what they call studio shock with the explosion of, you know, the first time I had money in my pocket. And I did it for 18 months, but the, I, I remember arriving at the, in front of a studio one day, and I had I had a session of two jingles to do, and and I I said to myself, if I go in the studio, I'm going to die, and I drove off, and I left a lot of people in deep doo doo, mm -hmm. not nice at all, no, and I regret that to this day, but uh, and so I became poor and free mm -hmm. what's important what's important is what's important to you and what's important to me is i wanted my i wanted to grow as a musician and i want musical freedom mm -hmm. i want freedom really is what i want and you have to fight for it and you have to pay a price for it but i can understand uh, especially especially in the in the studio in those those years I was playing in the studio and I saw the studio musicians but I saw them um, dying for mm -hmm. one you know would be because in those days the star the backup singers uh, the orchestra the brass the band the whole band everybody was in the studio because that's how we made records there was no electronic way you did it all together. And and so I'd be there and, he, and I'd see this guy and said, "We got music on the, on, on the on the music stand, but you know, but then there's a break and they've got you know top car, you know what you know or top boat, mm -hmm. so, or, or they're buying a new house, or and and that's it. And for me, that's that's the end of the road." Mm -hmm. Especially at, at, at my age, at, I mean, I was twenty, mid twenties, and it was, and so it was deadly. And so I left and became, became independent, and uh, rest is history, really. Mm. Well, your musical experience from being taken from studio to Tony uh, to Miles Davis, and starting your own band and Shakti, it shaped your playing in a particular way. You know, when I hear your recordings and I hear you playing, uh, you've got marvelous picking technique. You've got marvelous tone. And it seems that when you're phrasing, you're using bands from Vina. Uh, and it nearly seems that when El Shankar is sliding into notes, uh, you've got your Bigsby. That would translate yeah. that similar sound nowadays. Well, yes, and it's wonderful to see that this all projects into your playing. Those are these things that became a necessity in your playing, or uh, as a side effect of being involved in this kind of music with these wonderful musicians. Therefore, that's your journey, or you were working on these things in particular. You just said, "Oh, I want Bixby," or "I want a scallop neck on a guitar." Now, what I wanted, because it's in, on guitar, it's very easy to bend up. Mm. But you cannot bend down. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, in Indian music, um, they have such uh, high bends. For example, I've heard Balachandra, the Vina player, bend an octave. <laughs> which is phenomenal. And then he'll play inside an octave, or at least a fifth, he played different note, but mo by moving down. And and this, I, I, I missed this. Hmm. Not only, not only, not only uh, Indian musicians, you hear Coltrane, and sometimes, and this is, this is, this is like, this is the blues, this is part of the blues, and the blues, whether it's Asian or whether it's East or West, um, Miles, Miles would drop a note. Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, you know, and and brass players, they there's a way to do it, and but the guitar was very difficult. And the only the only 
way to do it is is the big B or whammy bar, mm. and, and because this it puts you can put expression from your finger. I know we can all do that. You can bend it. You can you can modulate it, but you cannot detune it. Mm-hmm. And this is an aspect of expression that I really wanted, because it's it. This is what I hear inside my mind. So, already um, I knew about the Bixby actually already. My goodness, in the 1950s, mm-hmm. I and there was some. I forget his name. I heard a country country player, not Chet Atkins. He was really good, and he had a Bixby. And he brought the note down. So already when I was about 15, Mm -hmm. this had an impact on me. Anyway, it took me a while to to, to get the the Bigsby on the guitar, but it's been there for quite a few decades now. (laughs) So, and it's here to stay. I mean, he used it on, on, on is, you know, this album, Is That So? Is that so? Yeah, that's your latest project. Where where I'm using I'm using the, the of course a MIDI controller, but it's with a guitar, and so and this I find particularly effective, like with this tone, because there's um and and it's it's not to do it just to bend, you know, because sometimes you hear the blues players, you know, on the or the modern day rock blues players they're they're bending uh, you know and, and but you know sometimes it's a little over the top mm-hmm. uh but every now and then it's really really it just comes from inside and and that note has to go down and do you use your 335 for this with the scalp neck no, 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 no. I have been using my uh, my PRS now. Okay. Such a lovely instrument. Yes. I don't have it here, but I'm sure you've seen a picture of it. I, I have, I have. Uh, you have mentioned something exciting. You mentioned that there was an element when you heard that particular uh, country player bending a note and, or using a, a big speed. That was a part that was kind of like a mark in your guitar education, let's say. Uh, I wonder if you were to sum up your uh, different marks in your guitar education from when you got your first instrument uh, until to a point where you're now. What were the life life changing or guitar changing kind of moments? I, I would say for me it could be the moment I discovered you know, blues, and then I discovered the pentatonic scale, and then it went on, or then the first time I played my first classical piece. Did you have any of these marks? Uh, most definitely. I mean, the guitar, I was already a piano student. I've been a piano student for four years when the guitar arrived. Um, but it coincided with, you know, I was very fortunate. I had three elder brothers, and two of whom were in university, uh, at the beginning of the 1950s, when the blues boom hit the UK, and so I had, and they they saw right away how attached to the the guitar I was. So they 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 just started to bring records home, and because of the blues boom was hitting the UK, especially university students, they were bringing these blues records home. That was a radical change in my life because I, prior to that. I'd been listening to classical and playing classical music. So uh, from that point, they continued my education. God bless them, uh, because they, they kept bringing blues. Whether Big Bull Brunsy was the first one, Muddy Waters the second one, and and Lead Belly was the third one. Um, and then uh, it went on, of course, with with. Uh, Lightning Hopkins, Mississippi Fred McDowell, Robert Johnson, of course. Um, but within a couple of years, by the time I was 13, 14, around the same time I had this Indian music, 
um, they brought home this flamenco guitar. And this was another revolution. Mm. Just, and in fact, I was so taken by it. I wanted to be a flamenco guitar player. But I was living in this little town way up in the northeast of England, just south of the Scottish border, uh, where nobody had ever heard of flamenco music. Uh, and you really, you need a teacher, you need a guru to, to learn flamenco music. And then along came jazz and then Django Reinhardt. From Django Reinhardt, this, was, this became my way. Because I, I, I couldn't find uh, I couldn't find a flamenco teacher anywhere. But Jack Reinhardt was amazing. He's still amazing to this day. So really the record player became my teacher. And, and I would just bother everybody by lifting the needle off and then, I'm sorry, I have to listen to this again. You know, I love it. Uh, and I, I was, I mean, they would walk out of the room when I was... <laughs> Because I say, I have, to, I have to learn this, what he's doing here. Um, and then uh, Miles Davis. I was introduced to Miles Davis in 1958 called uh, Milestones. And this was, um, this was uh, another revelation. Um, but he didn't have a guitar player. But... What he did have was um, Coltrane playing saxophone, and he had uh, he had Red Garland on milestones, but on Kind of Blue he had Bill Evans, who became another one of my heroes. Um, but the way of playing, I spoke about this before, about Miles and this concept, this modal concept, and how he approached improvisation and music through his trumpet, and how Coltrane adapted that and uh, developed it in the most amazing way. Um, this was my school. I mm -hmm. felt this was my school. And so I, and I've been learning ever since. This, this is the foundation of my school. Yes, bebop, uh, we all know, and, and bebop was also part of my school because, because it was inevitable. Miles was playing with Charlie Parker when he was, I don't know, 18, 20. Uh, those recordings are still around, uh, but bebop never hit me like like the Miles School, train school. Mm. But it was the way they played, and and since there was no guitar player, and I was very not happy that there was no guitar player in either Miles band or Coltrane's band. But I just said, well, this is the this is the yardstick, this is the barrier or the bar, not the barrier, it's the bar. And it ha I have to be at this bar, this because if I'm gonna play, if I'm gonna do anything, and it has to be the, at this level. And so I've, I listened only to Miles and Coltrane. I didn't listen to them. I know I heard Wes Montgomery and, and Jim Hall and Tal Fallow and, the, and wonderful guitar players, but they weren't playing the way Miles and Coltrane were playing. And that was my school. And it still is my school. Mm. I still listen to them and I'm still inspired by them. Uh, so that was it. And so it went along like that until Jimmy came along. The prior to Jimmy, there'd been already movements in the mid sixties towards uh, because the only guitar, the only amp, uh, had a kind of jazz tone, you know, this kind of classical jazz guitar tone, mm. and uh, which didn't satisfy me at all because I mean, I, I, I was hearing Coltrane playing two notes at a time, almost kind of distortion. And so, I, I, uh, I've got myself an amp that I could crank up a little bit and break out of this pure classical kind of jazz guitar, Jim Paul, mm. which don't don't get me wrong. I, I admire these guys. They're marvelous players and musicians, but uh, it's not Coltrane and it's not Miles. And the way Miles and, 
would phrase and Coltrane would phrase that, that, that and you know, even with these, they were bending notes, but they bend notes down as well as up. Mm. So all of these things from, from the teenage through the twenties, all the way through to, to the end of the sixties. But that said, even though I wanted to be a jazz musician, I survived by playing rhythm and blues. But it was clear, already listening to Miles in 1958, Miles, no matter what, what tune he was playing, he was playing the blues. Hmm. So, I mean, he played these standards. The blues was always there. And, and this sat very well with me because my first influence on guitar was from the Mississippi blues players, and my love to this day. Mm. And if you were to compare students nowadays, can you see any things that you like that they are doing really well? And do you see where there are maybe some pitfalls? And what are kind of false assumptions that young students or younger generation makes? Uh, the standard is amazing. Hmm. The standard of playing is amazing. What I'm missing is the, the development of, of the big personality. And it's not that they're, they're not as passionate. I, I'm sure they are. But this, it's a different kind of passion or desire in music than there was in the 1950s and 60s. Hmm. Well, that's probably got to do with a different being in a different world. But I don't see, there are one or two, I am, uh, but they're more closer to my age. Someone like uh, Gonzalo Rubalcaba, mm -hmm. the Cuban pianist. Um, absolutely astonishing musician. I, strong personality but i would like to see more development of 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 the integrated man mm -hmm. the younger because there's i would like to see more western musicians uh, learning the art the the culture of the East, in general, mm -hmm. India in particular, because when you come down to it, it's not it's not just the notes you're playing or the rhythms you're playing, because every time you play, you're telling a story. And what is your story? And your story is really the story of your life. But how rich is it? And how deep did you feel about it? How articulate are you in expressing those unspeakable emotions? Um, and this comes from the integrated man or person. Mm. And I don't hear enough. I don't hear, I want, uh, let me put it in a, a a little more bluntly, you know, in the 50s and 60s, there was more blood on the stage. There's no blood. No, there is, but not much. There's mm. no blood. <laughs> and, but sometimes it's fake blood. If you mm. know what I, mean. I, I do. I do. It's not the same. But uh, we, we, I would like to see, for example, I would like to be able to name somebody to replace me in Shakti. I'm going to go one day, but I don't know anybody. I don't have, I, I mean, and Shakti's been in existence since 73. That's a long time. But who can, I don't know anybody I can recommend who can sit with Zakir or Zakir's student or Zakir's son, whoever thing, but a masterly player and, and, and be able to understand what these people are doing and how they're playing and the sophistication and complexity of the music. But that's not to say that they're not in the West because there are some, there are some marvelous players. But I would like to see more of the spirit. 
I have to say it more. Um, and I think we need it today. We're in a very strange place, society. A very, uh, <clears throat> I think because of, of the way society has developed over the last 60 years and music's, music suffered as a result. A musician suffering in the, the lack of possibility. Mm -hmm. the, the, the lack of, of being able to get a record deal which in the 1960s, it's not that it was easy, but if you really worked hard and you and you you created something, then they were interested. These people they'd get and they'd give you a shot at it. Today, where did they get a shot? These young musicians, and where did they get the time and and the and the the energy and the, the need to, to create a new form, to develop a new form? It's uh, it's extremely difficult. I know. I have. I like to help young musicians, and I have a number that I that I try to help. And it's really difficult, Peter. It's mm. very because the opportunities are not there anymore. So the only thing you have to do is to be really strong. But as mm. great Vivekananda said, there's only one religion, and that's strength. <laughs> You're a person that is practicing yoga, am I right? Yes. Okay. Uh, could you just briefly explain what kind of impact it had on your health? Because you are still touring uh, and still playing, and you're at an incredible age in an incredible form, playing form. Well, it's not just it's not just yoga. I started doing yoga already 50 years ago, uh -huh. um, and I did a lot, uh, but. At, at one point, I was doing so much, uh, it was like, well, what's next? And the only thing that's next is self-discovery, mm -hmm. which is really where the, it's the only place we can go to find answers to the great existential questions. Mm -hmm. Who am I? The singular most important question that some people address in their life. Uh, <clears throat> so... But what's clear is that the years I did yoga have helped me immensely. I continue to do a little yoga every day, mm -hmm. just stretching to keep supple. But what's crucially important is meditation. Mm -hmm. because if I eat so my body survives, I meditate so my soul survives. Mm -hmm. So there, there, is really that's what it is i i would also say there are things like exercise living cleanly not that i'm against a glass of wine to the contrary but uh i've been stopped eating red meat uh, mm -hmm. many years ago okay so you have to you have to yeah but what not that i i i want everybody to be vegetarian <laughs> i can just recommend it that's all mm -hmm. and uh and be healthy we all know how to live if we listen to our body our body tells us all the time what's good for us do we ignore it or do we listen to it well you you mentioned the important question who am i because who we are it's so much more than what we think than with our little life and little habits and what we do and we are inseparable from the cosmos mm -hmm. but of course because we're ignorant mm -hmm. and, and I would point out the word ignorant comes from ignore so it's not it's not uh, it's not such a pejorative word we ignore is the problem we ignore mm -hmm. who we are we don't pursue this quest, which is the most important <laughs> quest that yeah. we can have in life. Not that you will find an answer because what you are in the end is no thing. We are no thing. We are pure spirit. Mm -hmm. That's all. But
you have to take, one has to take, I have to take time out every day and go in that special place where I'm part of the cosmos. Mm. And I feel connected to everything and everyone. Mm -hmm. and that's crucial to me. I would say a lot of students and professional musicians, they will be struggling with balance. And it could be a balance, you know, between finding time for their loved ones or finding time for their work and then finding the balance between what's commercial enough so it can satisfy you and what is artistic enough what satisfy you how do you look at it yourself if you want to make time for something such as meditation you know to discover yourself uh, is that priority number one well Hila, we've all got 24 hours a day. How are you going to spend them? It's mm. like money, isn't it? Mm. How are you going to spend it? You're going to spend 10 hours sleeping, 9 hours sleeping, 8 hours sleeping. What are you going to do with this? If somebody gives you $100, what are you going to, how are you going to spend it? You have mm. to think about it. You have, every day we have 24 hours. How do you spend it? You need to, we need to be disciplined, but we're not, we're very indolent, and lazy, well, but this human nature, no, yeah. I know, because I recognize it in myself, but this is, this is, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, uh, nasty about it, it's just, just the way human nature is, but we are more than human nature, this is what I'm saying, and, mm -hmm. and, and but we have to access that place where we see clearly and where we feel deeply. Mm -hmm. And this happens only when in self-reflection. And basically meditation is just self-reflection. Do you, you know, and you might sit down and, and after five minutes, two minutes, it's like, you know, well, nothing's happening. I'm just in a big black space. But, you know, and then people say, oh, I can't be bothered with this. You know, because there is some gratification. That's the way of the world today. Mm. But for example, the, the album Love Supreme, John Coltrane, even I've been listening to Coltrane for years, when the album came out, I had no idea what he was doing musically. But there was a poem on the back, a very beautiful poem on the back of the album. And I knew the music was identical, spoke, in the same way about the, it was almost a prayer. Hmm. And, and so I realized that if I don't, I'm not hearing it, it's my fault, not his. I'm too stupid. I have to educate myself. And so I listened to that album every day for a year. Finally, after a year, I heard what he was doing and I understood and I related directly to it. Because, but if, but I had to work for it, and there's, there's there's so much music and art and culture around the people. This the way of the world is kind of instant gratification, you know. With the Spotify, you know, you listen five seconds. If you don't like it, you you, you, you move on, you know. And it's a different world, and, and there's different attitudes towards music. Uh, this sort of attitude toward work, you know, we we have to recognize that we don't know. I I do. I can say it myself. I know not much about very little. <laughs> so that being so, it's my responsibility to learn more about what I am, who I am, what is this unbelievable universe we're living in. What are we doing here? And why are we killing each other? And why do we hurt each other when the nature of the universe is the opposite? But to, to address these questions, we have, to, we, we have to take time out. Your questions are very, very deep and very important about the nature of music. Because the nature of music and, and today's society, 
it's hard. You put the radio on. Do you hear something? Yeah, you hear something, some blues or something or some. But to hear something that's really soulful, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's all hamburger music, isn't it? Mainly. And some of it's really good. Not that I eat hamburgers, but some of it, some of it is really good. And I and I I love rock and roll because I grew up in the sixties. Yeah. <laughs> so I was very much part of that psychedelic period. Oh yes. But I spent the sixties playing R and B to survive. But and then again, you know, you look at Charles Mangus mm. and the records he was making in already in 1960, blues and roots. I mean, this is great jazz musician, but it's like R&B. It's wonderful. You know, and Miles' favorite record that I played on, Jack Johnson, and this was a jam, and this started off with R&B. Mm -hmm. You know, and he heard that, and he ran into the studio and just spontaneously played about 15 minutes, the most amazing, amazing music. Because that was rhythm and blues and miles and the blues, they were one. <laughs>